Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, today I'm giving you a fright with a creepypasta from Darren Sauls called The Stygian Child. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also join the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. An additional content warning. The story in this episode is not for the squeamish. We're doing our best to keep your brother comfortable. However, at this point, I'm afraid it's all we can really do for him," said Dr. Norman, resident medical coordinator for the Ty Rothwell Compassion and Care Center. The infection is pretty persistent, but we think we have him on the right antibiotic. It's not grave, but his condition is serious. I'm going to be honest, it could go either way. Thank you, doctor. I, I understand. I'll just go in and, and sit with him then, if that's okay. Peter Schiles spoke softly, appropriate for the lateness of the hour and the fact he was in an ICU. The doctor gently patted him on the shoulder, motioning him to his brother's room. Peter entered quietly, wishing to not disrupt his brother's rest. Peter was anxious about seeing his brother in such a condition. He was relieved to find that his brother appeared to be sleeping comfortably and facing the other way. "'Hello, Peter?' came Victor's gruff voice hoarse and dry-sounding. Hello, Vic. The girls say hello. I I've, I'd have brought them, but, y you know, school. Peter spoke softly with a hint of cheerfulness, trying to act as normal as possible. He knew Victor would want that. Vic was never one to have people fawn over him, and Peter knew he'd especially hate it in a situation like this. With a groan and great effort, Victor pushed with his arms until he was laying on his back, facing his younger brother. I hope it's not too early in the morning for you, Pete," Victor said, while adjusting the angle on his hospital bed to a more upright sitting position. No, it's my day off, I'm good," Peter said, and then took a seat near the bed. Peter would never complain, but they both knew Peter had driven a good five hours to get to the care center. See that envelope on the table? Victor asked and motioned to a small red envelope sitting on a stand near his bed. Yes, Peter replied. In that envelope, there's a key to a safe deposit box, as well as directions on where it can be found. Everything is set up at the bank for you. They know you'll be coming for it soon. You only need to show them your ID, Victor said. His voice becoming gravelly, and he began to cough deeply. The coughing rattled Peter, forcing him to accept for the first time just how sick his brother truly was. Victor was dressed in a hospital gown with a light blue diamond pattern on a plain white background. The blue in the gown was made brighter by the pale look of his brother's pallid skin. Darker blue veins were clearly visible through Vic's paper-like skin. The arms of the poor man were bruised and bandaged from God only knows how many IVs. The most striking thing about the otherwise near corpse of a man was his eyes. Even though he bore gray hair and the gaunt face of a sickly old man, Victor's eyes were youthful and full of life, as sharp as ever. 
On a face nearly devoid of color, what drew immediate attention were the soft, heather-gray eyes of a boy. Peter averted his own eyes from his brother's and meekly picked up the envelope. In the bank vault, there's about $10,000. <coughs> uh, there's also a list of what needs to be done when I'm gone. You know me, I've, I've, I'm always prepared in nearly all circumstances, Victor said with a big smile. He'd have laughed, but it might have caused another choking fit, so he stopped himself. There, there's also a note expressly for you in that vault. The letter explains a few things that I need you to know, but it, it won't make a bit of sense if I don't explain <coughs> if I if I don't explain something important to you first. Peter was confused. He knew that his brother was an organized person, so a box with final instructions made some amount of sense to him, but a letter to him didn't. Peter had never been close with Victor. Victor was more than 20 years older than Peter. Victor's mother died when he was very young. It took time for his father to remarry, but Victor's father eventually found a second wife who was quite a bit younger than him, and they had Peter. It bothered Peter that Victor often acted as if his entrance into the family pushed the older brother out of it. Victor was independent and already on his own when Peter came along. Peter felt the relationship between them was more like that of distant relatives than the close one most enjoyed with a sibling. Peter realized Victor's expression had turned to sorrow. This was a look Peter had never seen before from his brother, one filled with regret and dismay. Peter thought maybe he was about to learn something horrible about his brother, like he was secretly stashing bodies for the mob or something. If Victor cried right at that moment, Peter wouldn't have been surprised. The older appeared that distressed. I, I saw something, Victor said, in a voice full of sorrow and fear, or possibly shame, it was hard to tell. His face was full of dread. I never talk about it, but I need to confess this thing to you right now because I will be dying soon. I need to tell someone. Peter was alarmed by his brother's words. Sure, Victor was in bad shape, but there was still a decent chance the infection in Victor's chest would clear. You shouldn't talk like that, Vic. You need to have a positive outlook on these things. You can beat this infection. It's not an immediate death sentence. I'm only here because you personally asked me to come, not because I think this is the end of all ends," Peter said quickly in an attempt to build up Victor's mood. He didn't want to address the other part of his brother's mysterious comment. Listen, Peter, it doesn't matter what they do, I know it's over. I'll die in less than four hours, at about ten minutes after nine, Victor said with absolute certainty. Peter wasn't sure what to say about this comment. He didn't understand why his normally strong brother was giving up so easily. It wasn't like Victor at all, or at least not the Victor he knew. You see, I was told I would be dying today at that exact time. I was also told that you would be here when I died. Actually, believe it or not, I was told I'd be telling you this story. <laughs> <coughs> Hard to believe, huh? Victor's tone clearly said that this was a matter of fact. Did some fortune teller convince you of that? Peter asked, alarmed and more than a little bit angry. This only caused his brother to laugh heartily. It was good to hear his brother laugh, but it still confused Peter. <coughs> <coughs> I wish uh, <coughs> I just ignore it if that was the case. Mediums and fortune tellers can't predict crap. Victor's demeanor suddenly changed again. Now he looked as if he was about to collapse under a deep horror. No, this, this is something else entirely. entirely. C could you go get me a can of soda? Uh, cola, please. Peter was puzzled by his brother's response, but immediately sprang into action to fulfill his brother's request. It was clear that Victor was still troubled. He certainly didn't want to talk about whatever he was able to discuss. Peter didn't know his brother as well as he could, but he could see his anxiety plain as day. What I need to tell you is going to sound unnatural, crazy even, but it happened as sure as dawn, Victor said, and winced. 
It doesn't matter if you believe me anyway. You will in the end. I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't seen it. Victor laughed again. <laughs> you, you, you certainly, you certainly will in the end. Then without further ado, Victor began to tell his tale. There was one time back in the war, some, some time after the Tet Offensive, when I found myself alone in this buggy, wet, nasty jungle area. I wasn't stupid. I knew I was in trouble because I was off a ways from where I needed to be. I don't mind saying I was scared to death out there. I was making my way slowly and quietly back, listening. I put myself in that unfortunate situation and I knew I'd be lucky to make it back. There came a time, though, there in the near darkness, and I found a dead body just slumped near a log face torn away and blackened. As an American like me, it made me feel tired and alone. There's a lot of death in that time. You had to keep your wits about you. The, the guy was half hidden behind the log. I knew enough to not get too curious. This situation was more than likely a booby trap, so I started checking the area, looking for tells. I have to admit, I was far too focused on my studying of the situation to notice there was a figure only ten feet away from me. I never saw the approach. In the midst of a war, when everyone in a uniform is generally heavily armed, you should never do what this guy did. He let out a loud whistle to gain my attention, like, like you do to call in farm animals. The noise pierced the gentle sounds of the canopy. I didn't react as quickly as I should have. Of course, I jumped to the ground and did my best to take some sort of cover. If it had been an enemy combatant, I'd have died right then, <coughs> right then and there. <coughs> I did, however, recover my marbles enough to target the character. Again, for the second time in that many seconds, I was taken off my guard. I couldn't completely see the person there, but... They were only about a meter high and unarmed, as far as I could see. I didn't want to shoot a kid, but this was a strange war. A strange war. <clears throat> I needed to play it close to the cuff. Victor finished that thought and took a sip of soda. In the dark of the seemingly quiet yet frightening jungle, in the middle of the maelstrom that is war, Victor found the devil. Do not worry yourself, Victor Shull, came a voice from the direction of the mysterious shadowed figure. The voice was unsettling to hear. The words were clearly of human origin, but were laced with inhumanity and impurity. The voice was so awful, my senses begged me to open fire and kill whatever was there. The shadow person sounded like a prisoner of hell who'd escaped and now walked the earth. The voice frightened me more than anything else in the whole damn war put together. One thing was for sure, it was noticeably the voice of a child. The other clear thing was that he was ungodly and malignant. That dead one over there is not rigged to kill, came that wicked voice again. The figure's word was less than reassuring. I was. I was more afraid of this new arrival than any enemy artillery that awaited me on the battlefield. Who are you with? That was about the only thing I could stammer out at the moment. A deep demonic laugh, much, much deeper than a child's laugh, rumbled loudly, resonating around in the gathered trees. The foliage waved eerily, the creature's chortle. I do believe I am with myself alone, Victor, came that voice, now restored to the innocent yet distorted child's voice. It put me off, hearing that innocent yet corrupted voice. It wasn't lying, I could tell. I started creating scenarios in my head to explain how a child could end up here, miles from nowhere, and speak in perfect English. Well, how did you get here then, I asked hoping to start piecing together the mystery. I suppose like you, the war brought me here, said that enigmatic poisonous voice. 
You're not military. I don't think you're a civilian either, so who are you? I was even more puzzled then when I began the questioning. I suppose that's the most sane question before you. Let me introduce myself, the voice began. That same childlike tone, but the vocalization, it slowly lowered in pitch until, <coughs> until, until the very last word sounded as if maybe the devil himself were speaking directly to me. I'm the one called Ioxic, but I prefer you call me Sanguine, like the color of blood. The shadowy one raised its hand and pointed at a close-by tree. A flash of light pulsed from its hand at lightning speed. The tree erupted into flames as if hit by an incendiary bomb. It flashed so bright, Victor needed to shield his eyes from the pain and blinding light the sudden illumination caused. When his eyes cleared, the place was lit as if it were nearly daytime. The thing I'd been speaking to was completely visible now and moved to within four feet of my position. I raised my weapon to fire on it and I damn near pulled the trigger. I wouldn't do that, Victor, it said. Gunfire would only draw attention and your toy wouldn't hurt me anyway. The being standing near him was an honest-to-goodness vision from a nightmare or demon. At least Victor was sure at the time it was a demon. It definitely appeared to be a child, but it was obviously in disguise. He wasn't sure what a church would call these things. The beast looked like it could be any ordinary little boy playing on the playground in a schoolyard. It wore a pair of green cotton shorts and a burnt orange t-shirt under a cotton vest that matched the green shorts. All its clothes were stained, coated with a mix of dried and fresh blood. The boy's arms and legs were unnaturally white, like the texture of wax figures. The hands were entirely supernatural. There were no hands or feet at the ends of the stumps that acted as legs and arms. Instead, there were black appendages that looked like roving, gnarly tree roots. They appeared ethereal as they moved, like charcoal-colored rivers that searched and tasted the air with the flickering tongue of a viper. The head of the creature was entirely a picture of the accursed. The face, the same pale color as the arms, was covered in various shades of crimson red. There was fresh gore on the animal as well. Where the eyes naturally should have been, a piece of cloth, possibly gauze, was wrapped. The piece of material covered the eye sockets, which appeared to be empty. Signs of severe trauma could be seen around them. The wounds on the eyes were fresh, but the dried blood on the clothes told a different story. The dressing, or whatever it was, was in dire need of changing. The bandage was beyond holding any more blood, so gobs of the red, vital fluid dripped out from under the wrappings like crimson tears. The thick head of neatly tended blonde hair stuck out. It was the one thing on the beast that didn't look like an aberration, yet that made it the most disturbing thing about it. I had my gun raised, prepared to take off its head, but then I realized it'd be futile against something so obviously ghostly. The truth is, it was right. Shooting would draw attention, and I didn't want that. I had no idea what to do at that point, so, well, then the thing did something that I didn't expect. It offered to, to save my life. What the hell would you do that for? I asked. The thing liked to talk, I, I could tell. You'd think that something that powerful wouldn't be so chatty, but it was more than happy to speak with me. He told me that I was about to be killed in a firefight the next morning. It could see these things, evidently. It said that I'd die and that there was nothing I could do to avoid it. You never know what you'll do in the face of certain things, you know, but when you see a mythical type of creature standing there in front of you and it tells you you're going to die, it's, in, it's entirely believable. I was sure, even though it was a demon, of <coughs> I was sure, even though it was a demon of some sort, that that, that part of its story was probably true. It took perverted joy seeing my reaction to this revelation. 
It offered to show me my death if I chose, but I, I refused. Give me some time to convince you it's in your best interest to let me help you, the beast said. I wasn't going to listen to any demon telling me these kind of things. They were probably deceptions. You were my soul or something. No, if I die tomorrow, you're going to have to go back to hell without me, I told him. I just started to laugh so loud I thought my ears might bleed. <laughs> uh, he started laughing a deep, sinister chuckle. Cleared the area of any wildlife. All manner of animals took off at that sound of the wicked amusement. I'm no devil, soldier. What would I do with your soul anyway, he said. I don't want a bunch of human souls following me around forever, wondering what they should do every second of the day. It'd bore me. He waved his hand at me, sort of mockingly. I have a different reason for talking with you, Victor. Well, I didn't like the sound of that. Whatever he was talking about, it sounded worse than the devil pining for my soul. What could possibly be worse than an eternity in constant torment? A morbid curiosity struck me. I, I was oddly interested in what it had to say. Well, if you're not, if you're not a demon, then what are you exactly? I said, keeping my gun leveled at its head. Hmm, what am I? I'm the, the being that all the demons in the world are based on. I'm the one that people see, but when they describe me, the story always changes. <laughs> I'm the one who stalks your children, even though I never really have. I'm the vampire that drinks the blood, but that isn't all what I do for those like you. I'm the one that steals your soul. But that too is only a story. It said all of this in the voice of a toddler, but, but tinted with, with a menacing, savage tone. It, it slowly glided towards me, and it slumped near the log. I met this one 27 years ago. It was a Friday. He agreed to meet me again, just like I hope you agree to meet with me again, he said. On a later date, of course. Well, I didn't like the sound of that either. The creature extended its feelers, and they stretched and wrapped around the dead soldier's body like a net. The root-like appendages brought the unfortunate man to a sitting position and pushed into the man's flesh slowly and steadily. What I really am, Victor, is a necromancer of sorts. This man is trapped in a limbo that I created. He's unable to pass on until we settle the agreement. I have his essence now. If you want to call it a soul, I won't argue. It's trapped here in this corpse. I can't steal his soul away, but I can hold it. Keep it his body fresh, in a sense, the child said, tilting its head like it was listening to the dead body speak. I can smell this with his fear, and I hear him slowly dying. Do you want to hear too, Victor? <laughs> God, no, I yelled with a complete aversion to what I was seeing. Oh, well, it amuses me enough, it said, and let out an awful childlike giggle infused with demonic delight. I'll let this man's spirit or soul go after he pees up. It's part of the deal we made years ago. First, I get what I was promised. <laughs> First, I get what I was promised in this bargain. The same bargain I'm offering you. That's, I said quickly, but was too odd to continue. I didn't know what to say. I felt as if I might hyperventilate. I was sickened by the things I was seeing and hearing. I thought it couldn't be real, but well, it was playing out right there in front of my eyes. I can make it so tomorrow doesn't happen the way it was meant to, he said. I can change one person's day tomorrow, and I have chosen you. I have that ability, I promise you. All you need to do is make this a simple agreement with me. He nodded his head toward the body. I just threw up my arms in dismay, unable to respond to the truly ghastly idea, still not entirely sure what the beast wanted. 
You only need to agree to watch me feed and agree to let me feast on the day you pass, like I am about to do here and now, the beast said, twisting its head and opening its maw to look at me. This revealed twisted, misshapen yellow teeth that grew in various shapes and sizes through a wicked smile. The teeth came up and twisted around other teeth, sometimes into the jaw itself. One thing was certain, every single tooth came to a needle-sharp point, except for only a couple that were broken off. There was a mockery of a smile on its face. Even though this expression was offered like one would offer a smile, dripping saliva exposed it as nothing more than a hungry animal intent on eating. Let me eat the flesh you'll no longer need when you find the cross and watch as I feed so I can enjoy your aversion and fear. <coughs> I will, for my part, see to it that you live past tomorrow. That's the long and short of it. Well, I didn't like the idea of what was being offered, but I did not like the idea of dying in less than 24 hours all that much either. I was pondering what the creature said when it added its final pitch. You would die September 12th, 2023, about 10 minutes after 9 in the morning. You'll be resting in a nice clean hospital, and your younger brother Peter will be there at your side. You'll tell him this story. The abomination giggled again. He said he won't believe you at first, but he'll come to believe you in the end. I'll see a younger brother, I asked the demon child, astonished. It nodded its head feverishly. Dad had written to me, said that he was remarried, but I, honest, I honestly hadn't expected a brother out of the new marriage. I, I'd never even considered the idea of a baby brother. I'll look at the future for you, no cost, the demon said, and it dropped to its knees. The demon used its wisps of snake-like hands to produce a small crimson bag. The bag was possibly white at one time, but now, so stained with blood, it was red. The demon hastily reached its hand in and pulled something out, tossing it onto the ground in front of him. The beast lowered its head directly over some little trinkets, studying. Oh yes, the demon said, I'm sorry to say you'll never see your brother the way things are now. I was never to, it was never to be, he said, that is, unless you agree to my deal. Really? You want me to believe you could just read my future? I hissed. Oh yes, he said, I just read, read, just read your fate on the bones here on the ground. He said it as if that was a perfectly common occurrence. Bones, I asked. I was almost afraid to hear the answer. Ah, the bones of a mystical powerful creature chopped into perfect symmetry and soaked in the most putrid of swamp rot. You have to add a poison like snake venom and hemlock with other herbs, then the head of a bluebird and a drop of your own blood. That's why only I can use them, the child said, lowering his voice so nobody could hear the last part about the bones only working for him. So, you made those things with some bones from a, a unicorn or something? <laughs> I sneered at the idea. Unicorn, no! It was actually a rather large lizard, he said. They've been gone for a long time now, so the bones are precious to me. They are as accurate as the moon in the sky, it said, hissing at me, showing its twisted yellow teeth again. It scooped up the bits of whatever was on the ground, I never got a chance to see what they looked like up close, but seeing this creature, I didn't doubt they were bones of some sort. The deal would involve you eating my flesh when I die. How come that has to be a part of the deal, I said, tossing the idea around in my head. The soldier back there has not passed on as of yet. I have the power to keep him here and keep him fresh so I may feed, the beast said. If you make the deal he did, like him... You will be eaten. Feeding time will be over soon for him, and by this time tomorrow there'll be nothing between us anymore." The demon child turned its head to look over at the soldier, still in the spectral web and seemingly dead. 
your fate would be no different than his. The eating is part of the allure for me. It is not a case of simply filling my hunger. It is a case of watching you suffer too. You watching, knowing what it will look like when I eat your flesh and organs. That is the hunger you need to satiate in me. I have to say, it honestly drives me. You, <coughs> you'd pass in the morning as I told you. By that night, I'll have no more use for you or your soul, or whatever you call it. Why can you tell the future like this, I asked him. I, I was horrified and fascinated at the same time. That is for me to know. Ask yourself, human, have you ever heard or seen the likes of me? Has anyone told you stories of Ioxic, the Stygian child, or any of my kind? The oddity said angrily, as it took to a height almost matching mine. No, uh, I guess you're right, I said. If I accept you're real and here, I have to accept that other things I don't know are possible. I started cowering from the thing. I was sure the thing was going to kill me on a whim if he chose to, but... Well, it didn't seem to have that as a motivation. Then, uh, then why, do, why don't you feed on these other dead here? I mean, this is a battlefield. There must be plenty others you could find. Why choose specific people when there are always dead people? I said. I'm try trying to reason it out, you know. Ah, uh, good question, he said. I suppose it has to do with choice. My kind needs to have a bargain struck to really satisfy our darker cravings. The feeding is less about the act and more about the deal one strikes. You get a chance to live a life you might never have had, and I get your body to feast on. Nothing's ever free, he said in a scheming voice. The idea of a beast eating your remains that's not something you want to think about, but a little brother, well, that was that was too much to give up. So, you have no claim on my soul then, I asked, you know, just to be sure. I wanted to drive home that point. I wanted no part of being a servant to a demon. That's something I have no need for, really, said the child, as it, as it gave one of its sickening giggles again. Really? What is it with your souls? I don't want your life energy or anything. There are still rules set forth from the beginning. If I don't make a clear and concise deal for your soul, I can't claim it. The creature released the soldier from its grasp and shrugged as it spoke, as if it really had no idea what got into people's heads. I will live to the day you said, and you'll eat my flesh when I die. I said, you know, just confirming the particulars. Indeed. The creature nodded earnestly. Uh, that, that seems too, too good to be true. There, there's got to be something more sinister to it, I said. Indeed there is. I did say you must watch me feed, the child said, holding its root-like appendage toward the soldier on the ground. You'll be forced to watch as I eat human flesh, and you will know that one day... It will be you that I will come to feed on." The Stygian child dropped its chin a bit as a wide, wicked smile crossed its face. This was the evilest smile he could ever have imagined. The smile would forever stain Victor's nightmares. I knew now why the demon made these deals. It thrived on a person's fear. It must enjoy the pure pervasion that one feels when they meet an actual ghoul and witness it feed. It was a horrible choice that it was offering me. I knew that watching this animal feed was going to be far worse than anything I would seen in all my days, and I may have to live with the idea of facing that desecration myself. I, I think I can live with that then. If I live to see a brother I never knew I had? I think I can live with that, I said, afraid of what I'd just agreed to. Now I just hoped to get back and meet my brother, you. I think I had you pegged wrong, said the beast. I'd normally have to drow it on for hours to get people on board with the idea, but you jumped right in. Thank you. 
The beast finished with a truly abominable smile. It was silly, but terrifying. As stated in the bargain, your soul, or whatever you call it, it's all yours. I I'm only interested in prying away your flesh, it said. And as agreed, having you as witness to my feeding habits. I, I felt a, a, a better, a little bit better, you know, hearing the beast plan to stick to the agreed, agreed upon terms. I knew I'd be a witness to a ghastly act, but it'd be over soon enough. He told me, you know, a lot of the tales and folklore around this world stem from the likes of me, but my kind's stories are never told properly. They always get the basics wrong. He then drifted to the other side of the dead soldier, kneeling next to the corpse. The Stygian child lifted its awkward hands to its face and carefully slipped off the eye bandages. It appeared as if the bandages, as with any wound, were painful to the demon. The view underneath the bandages was about what Victor expected. There were two completely empty eye sockets, which were vacant but glistening with fresh, wet blood all the way back into the dark depths of the skull holes. It looked like a pickaxe or other tool was used to pry out the eyes of what could only be described as a sickly child. The figure was a paradox. It was clearly moving and bleeding all over everything. The creature was also speaking, but with no eyes it looked like a dead, empty human child with ugly dead vines growing from its hands. It was kneeling there, preparing to feed possibly to fill its emptiness. A soft hum started to emanate from the creature, and blood soon began to rush even more from the child's eye sockets. Small, green and blue pods of various shapes were being coughed up through the eye holes with the flood of blood. Tiny, undulating creatures also wiggled their way out of the Stygian child's eye sockets and fell to the ground around the dead soldier. It was something Victor had not been prepared for, and it instantly made him vomit. This drew a mocking, devilish giggle from the one called Ioxic. The eye socket creatures slithered and wriggled away. Many of the pod-like things burst open in audible pops like firecrackers. Creatures from inside them flew into the shadows. As fast as they'd come from the beast's empty eyes, they all went into hiding. The atrocity looked at Victor and said in a sadistically amused voice, Are you ready for this, Victor? Victor said nothing but shook his head that he was not. The idea of watching this thing feed on dead human flesh was now becoming all too real. Dinner time, my friends, he said. He raised both of his hands out straight over the soldier's body. His tentacle-like appendages grew to weave a complicated pattern over the soldier's body. The hands wove themselves into an octagonal pattern with a series of ancient letters and figures woven in them. The demon spoke, saying, One who made a bargain with me, you must at last pay your prize to me. The figure Ioxic made his hands change to a more solid shape that looked less like ghostly feelers. The fingers somehow molded themselves together, and a purple light shone in between the solid fingers. It was fascinating, as well as horrifying, watching the demon do his magic. The purple became a flame that consumed the hands like they were firewood. The creature howled as it gave its body tissue so the fire might be fed. Soon the purple flames died, and the hands were nothing more than white ash. The ash suddenly collapsed upon itself and fell to cover the soldier. The Stygian child stopped weeping and howling as a euphoric look crossed the beast's face. Ah! screamed the soldier as a great breath heaved itself into the man's lungs. His eyes were suddenly thrown open. They darted back and forth, frantically. He was panic-stricken. Never in Victor's life had he witnessed such fear in an individual's face. There was little doubt that if a man was able to die of fear, this poor soldier would have passed on. But the demon was not going to let the soldier die. Not yet. The demon talked to the soldier, saying, Oh, hello, Paul! and he leaned in to face him eye to eye. He said, You've known about this day for nearly three decades now. Victor was amazed and sickened to the point of unsteadiness that the soldier was now obviously animate and aware. It was a sobering moment. The child bent nearly to the ground, head 
parallel to the earth, right next to the soldier. The demon tore a whole forefinger off the soldier, right to the palm, and started chewing it like a piece of hard taffy. The soldier exploded with a piercing scream that echoed in the quiet night. Oh my god, you just ripped his finger off, I yelled, and I drew my gun level with the beast's head. Yes, that's what you do when you feed on something. You don't just swallow a chicken whole, do you? It asked me this while wiping a dollop of the soldier's blood from his cheek. I like the finger bones, he said. I like how they have just enough flavor to get my appetite going. The creature smiled at me. I could see bits of fractured and torn bone stuck between his teeth. The bones grounded its teeth with bits of knuckle and flesh. I nearly vomited again, but I held myself through the nausea. Though the nausea was strong, my knees buckled with a bout of dizziness. The beast might have been less disturbing if it didn't have the appearance of, of a child. If I was, if, if it was an ogre or, or something, some other mystical boogeyman doing it, it, it might have been easier to stomach. Maybe. He's still alive. You're supposed to wait until he's dead. Those were the rules, I yelled at him. I told you from the beginning, I kept his spirit here. Didn't you hear me say I was a necromancer of sorts? I told you all of this, he told me. You need to pay more attention when I speak. He rammed another one of his soldier's fingers in his mouth, ripping it off with his jagged teeth. Soldier reacted violently against that severe trauma. You said you let his soul go. You lied to me, I told him, angry at being duped. Oh yes, I'll let him die and be on his way when I'm done feeding the beast said. Then it finished crushing and grinding the bone and flesh on the second finger, finally swallowing. That wasn't the deal, I bellowed at him. Yes, it was, I oxic spat back angrily at me. That is, if, I, if it had been capable of glaring with those hollow eye sockets. His mouth slowly went from that determined sneer to that evil smile of his. It was always part of the bargain. You were too eager for your desire to realize the price. He's alive, though. I couldn't even form a sentence at that point. My God, the weeping and the, sh the shivering soldier. <laughs> it was enough to silence me. All words left me at that moment. Yes, Victor, and one day you will still be alive as I feed on you, spoke the demon, before he burst into an insane, disturbing trail of childish laughter. The awareness rapidly sunk in that I had agreed to a nightmare far worse than his death. I, I was in for a truly terrible fate, and, and like Cassandra of legend, I could do nothing about it. I was pulled back to the moment by a gut wrench scream from the poor man being fed upon. I turned my attention back to reality and I looked over to see the creature had taken one of the soldier's ears this time. It was using its newly formed root-like hands to tear the cartilage into pieces with the help of its teeth. It was then I used my rifle. I shot the child in the head. I could no longer stand for this abomination before me. However, as I'd half expected, the bullet did nothing, not even causing the creature to flinch, more or less passed through the beast. The skin was pierced and a simple hole appeared like a puncture in the sand. A small wound quickly folded in on itself and was gone. Skin like an hourglass just refilled the hole left by the bullet. I told you so, the wicked thing chuckled at me, didn't even bother its, to take its teeth out of the sobbing soldier's ear. The goal was completely dismissive of the bullet to the head. It was indifferent that I just tried to kill it. He slowly bent down to face the soldier, meeting the poor soul's fearful eyes with its two dead empty sockets. The soldier was quivering noticeably and desperately trying to pull out of the way. Unfortunately, unable to do little more than thrash about a bit. The creature lunged, sinking its mismatched teeth into the man's nose. Like, like a shark, the, the, the fiend had ripped its head back and forth rapidly until the man's nose finally gave way and 
and it was perched into the creature's jaws. The childlike figure pulled himself back to a sitting position. He started chewing happily on it. The, the soldier was howling in pain and begging the heavens for mercy, only causing the evil being to laugh and mock him by saying things like, Oh, please, let me go. I'll never do it again. Mommy, help me. The witty little man's hitting me. He was taking great joy in a man's suffering and pleading. I never dropped the barrel of the gun with a shot, but I put... I, I never dropped the barrel of his gun for the shot that I'd put in the demon's head. Well, I decided at least to cheat the demon to some victory. The flash came out of my barrel, my gun, and a weeping soldier's face was blown clean in half. I, I had to spare the man for the sake of all that was held, all that was held holy. Suffering for that poor man at least was over. You shouldn't have done that, Victor. Cheaters never prosper, you know. You only made the situation worse for our glum friend here, he said. He said it really calmly, too. Like He wasn't angry at all. Uh, his demeanor uh, it frightened me even more. I, I started to ponder what kind of punishment would, he would give me for, for my actions. But what? You, you gonna eat me alive then? Huh? We have a bargain. I know what's going to happen to me and when. In the deal, you set the date. It is not today, I said. I lowered my gun. I knew I couldn't use it on the demon anyway. No, Victor. Worse for him, said the demon. And a deep, dark laughter rumbled the area, not childlike whatsoever. Ioxic waved his hands over the soldier's body, again performing the intricate weaving ceremony he'd done before. The same purple flame engulfed the child's hands. Immediately, another veil of ash powdered the fallen soldier's body, this time with far more dramatic effects. The ash moved like white-colored quicksilver and drew the headpieces back to the rest of the body and wove them back into their place. The bones crackled and splintered loudly as they took their proper places once again. His chest rose with another great breath and the soldier was back to the living, with his face and head restored as if a shot had not just blasted it away. Poor Paul, you aren't going to leave us quite yet. Nope, he said. He lifted the soldier's hand so I could get a good look at it. To my horror, the hand was completely restored. The fingers that had not been eaten away were were completely reconstituted, ready to be eaten a second time. <laughs> the demon proceeded to engulf the same index finger in its jaws and tore it away, viciously. The soldier again, struck with a massive jolt of pain, screamed out, face flushed in shock. It immediately made me sick again. I went to throw up, only to dry heave. I was forced to listen as that demon cracked bone and sinew and its ugly yellow teeth, making especially sure to chew with a wide open mouth, contents spilling open under the sh under its shirt and ground. This soldier probably knows that you were trying to spare him the extra pain, he said. What good did it do him though, huh? Kill him as many times as you like. I don't mind starting over again and again. More and more for me to swallow. I finally, I finally let my rifle fall to the ground. It wasn't of any use. I was disgusted. I, I started to leave them in the area, but I needed to leave. I knew, I knew I'd forever hear that man's pain and. The grinding of his bones in the in the creature's mouth, I'd seen too much. I I got about three feet when Hyoxic spun me back around, so I, I nearly fell to the ground. How dare you leave me now, he bellowed, sending blood and, and bits of body tissue flying out of his mouth onto my onto my my face and uniform. It was amazing how fast he, he reached me. 
He moved at least eight yards in, the, in like a second. I didn't hear a thing. I was looking at that demon face. I couldn't see any eyes. But he, he was angry. If you think this man's suffering was overbearing because of a mistake you made, it was not, he said. It was this man's choice, as your choice was yours. If you think eating flesh is so horrible, imagine what your punishment will be for disobeying an agreement with me. The creature proceeded to lift me off the ground and he carried me back to that suffering soldier, dropping me on top of him. I moved as fast as I could to get off of the poor guy. He grunted as I finally found my way off of him and I, I took a position sitting next to him. I'm sorry I shot you, Paul. I... I was trying to save you from this. I, I didn't know about this. He was he, he was he was too afraid, uh, too much in pain. He didn't know I was there. I I knew my apology. It wasn't going to bring him any comfort. In the end, I I, I suppose that apology was more for for me than for him. And that imp settled back on the ground next to the soldier positioned itself on its knees and resting his hands like his hand like things on his chest slowly leaned down again like when he when he'd ripped off the man's nose before I waited for the beast to again rip off the nose cringing in dread and anticipation but the fangs of the demon latched onto the right cheek this time the beast twisted and pulled, eventually pulling a large chunk of meat from the face of the man. The soldier screamed, but the bellowing was distorted by the open gash in his cheek. The flesh of the man had been torn clear through to the inside of his mouth. The, the jawline and teeth of the soldier were clearly visible through that new hole. It, it distorted his screams. For the third time, I, I had to vomit, but I just couldn't do it. This, this creature sat and, and chewed, happy as could be. Oh, my poor, poor Paul gurgled in pain. I noticed one of the unnatural creatures that clawed itself out of that, that child's eyes was, was creeping in from, from one of the shadows, moving towards the soldier's head. I watched as it slid its way to the opening on the side of that soldier's face. That nearly foot-long worm creature looked like, like a giant leech. Oh, no, leech. It's a thing of beauty. This, this one is almost as frightening and ugly as the demon child. It was blood red and slimy with, with bright orange and black markings and spirals around its undulating body. There, there was no head. You could see the mouth clear enough. The mouth had rows and rows of long, needle-sharp teeth, looking like a child's toy wind, wind spinner, you know? The teeth moved in that sucking, pulling pattern. Anything that encountered these teeth, that was going to go through that parasite's digestive system. I let out a disbelieving groan as the leech started wiggling itself into the man's jaw through that exposed flesh of hole in his cheek. The ugly blood red creature bored itself in just below the gum line and it was completely buried in the man's muscle. The leech wasn't the only unnatural thing in the soft light of the demon's presence. There were also what looked like translucent fish floating around them. These creatures had the general appearance of large pilot fish, colored only by soft pink dots. These fish are what popped out of the green pods from the demon's eyes. Fish was as close as you could get to describing what they looked like, but that fell short of how plain and dull they looked. Their big, pale gray eyes were the most pronounced feature. The eyes had a dull glow of ghostly light in them, but nothing else. There was no pupil, but you could feel that they were still watching intently. That was clear. They bore pectoral fins that gently waved as if floating in a calm, invisible ocean. These spectral fish had large, round, bottom feeder mouths, like the sucker fish in a fish tank that clamp themselves to the glass and clean away filth. They slowly glided around without sound and in lifeless, slow motion. They swam through the air on the edge of the darkness surrounding the area. Don't worry, 
They don't eat too much, the demon child said. And then the abomination did something I, I didn't expect. The beast balled its hand appendages into a kind of a fist, and he punched the soldier in the ribcage really hard. I, I hadn't expected it. It took me off guard. There was the clear sound of broken ribs, definitely internal injuries. The soldier cried out in pain. It tenderizes them, the demon said. Makes a soup in their gut that's to die for. Flesh and blood stained his jagged teeth. The child reached out and poked the area with the tip of its arm like, like a baker testing a loaf of bread. The beast shook its head in disappointment. Ah, this one's a bit stringy yet, he said. Then he struck the same area again, this time breaking the skin along with more ribs. The soldier let out another groan, nearly passed out from the pain. Oh, I wish he had. The creature grabbed the back of the soldier's neck violently, lifting the soldier's head so it was face to face with me. You will not pass out, Paul. We have a bargain, he said. I will not let you miss the dinner you promised me. The best part's just about to begin. You definitely don't want to miss it. Iox gently laid the soldier's head back on the ground, like a mother setting her precious child down for a nap. The beast flashed its hand out almost too fast to see and buried itself deep into the man's side. The arm passed into the back right side where the man's kidney was located. The hand ripped back out of the soldier's body just as fast as it went in. A sickening splashing sound was followed by blood splattering the ground. Victor began to vomit once again. The creature waited patiently for him to finish. When Victor finally returned his attention to the spectacle that he was forced to watch, he saw the creature held the engorged leech in his hand. Ioxic reached in and ripped the parasite from within the man's body. The blood-soaked thing wiggled, looking to try and get away, but the child's tentacle hands were too strong. The creature slowly moved his free arm back into the hole that he'd extracted the leech from and dug around. When the creature seemed to find what it was looking for, it pulled its arms back out with great speed. The loud pop of a bone was heard as the creature's hand was pulled out of the soldier. The demon now held a part of what looked like the man's rib. The creature proceeded to clean the flesh off the bone with its teeth and a sickeningly white tongue. Victor wouldn't have expected a forked tongue on a beast like this, but it was surprisingly long and thin. It sat gently gnawing away the bits of flesh, getting as much off as it could. Meanwhile, the leech creature was thrashing less and less, as if losing strength or the will to fight. He noticed the soldier's complexion was getting paler by the moment from the severe trauma. Maybe this meant the man would soon be past this torture. At least he hoped. The creature examined the rib bone it extracted, seemingly happy with how it had removed the flesh from the rib. It held the bone as high as it could with one of its appendages. The creature then used its root-like features to move on top of the soldier and pin him to the ground, positioning itself directly on the man's chest. It took the bone it was holding over its head and forcefully jammed it into the man's right eye. The soldier let out the greatest cry of pain yet in response. The child had used a particularly sharp part of the bone to break the eyeball. After stabbing it again and again, there was a gooey pool inside the man's eye socket. The screaming soldier was trying helplessly to wriggle out the whole miserable time that his eye was being assaulted. The creature took the fattened leech and dipped part of it into the remnants of the eye, like one would dip a cheese stick into a marinara. The creature bit into the leech and ripped off the part that had been dipped into the eye for flavor. It was about to dip the leech in again for another bite, but stopped and regarded Victor using the leech as a pointer. I'm not a demon, you know, he said. Ioxic dipped the leech in the eye socket again, with disinterest in the man's suffering and weeping, and pointed once again at Victor. Disgusting drops of goo dripped to the ground from the leech's body. I have the inspiration for the darkest stories you humans tell, he said. And then he lopped off another part of that leech, which was obviously dead now. Stories, he said, that's what I am, stories. And then he stopped up the rest of the eye fluid on that leech and, and, and devoured it. You are an incarnation of evil. You're basically a demon in my book, I said. How dare you compare me to a mere demon, he said.
pushing himself to his full height and causing great pain to that poor soldier underneath him. I was there when your kind was still roaming the lands, looking for food, and the wheel was a thousand years in the making. I was the dark thing in the deep parts of the cave that your people told stories about, and why they refused to go into the darkness there. <laughs> I was the one who frightened your ancestors into using fire, all to drive away the darkness, because I was there in that darkness. I, I was struck by that. It's true. Fire was a major step in mankind's evolution. C -c Could this creature have had a role in that? I had to admit that, that a natural fear of the dark it is inherent in people. The creature let Paul lay there in agony and drifted on its unnatural legs. It looked as if it had a mission. The glowing eyed, fish like creatures called Hallow Reavers in the near dark swished away from the area behind Victor as the demon approached. The creature stopped in front of him and put its twisted, rope-like hands up to its face like it was pondering something. The creature went on to take credit for a lot of man's folklore. He claimed man was not entirely accurate when telling stories about seeing him. Stories became legends, and a simple child in the dark consuming the dead becomes a big ape-like creature or gremlins. A creature that devours whole people, not just blood, becomes a blood-sucking vampire. The screams in the night heard as the demon fed became banshees and witches. It attributed the idea of demons to humans and said that it was not its first choice of title. I was sure this boasting was just elaborate fiction. The more it talked, though, the more I was convinced. Could one creature from ancient history be responsible for so many horror stories and creatures of folklore? Anyway, he said, none of that really matters as long as you know that I am more than what your stories say I am child demon turned and headed back to the sobbing soldier on the ground. It took a position standing at the man's feet, looking down on him. The Stygian child reached down with its ethereal fingers and let them encircle the man's right leg just below the knee. The rope-like vines started to slide back and forth around the leg. It was efficient, able to saw the man's leg off in no time. That had been the demon's goal. This was a calculated way of torture. The grinding bonds moved fast enough to rip the flesh away, but in a slow, deliberate manner. The pain in the man's face and his screaming was enough to drive one to madness by simply witnessing it. Victor found himself weeping along with the soldier. The man eventually could scream no longer and went catonic as his leg slid off. The evil ghoul hauled the leg to the soldier's chest and laid it there, using his chest as a dinner table. The beast took out a knife and started to carve pieces of flesh from the bone and feast on them. The creature acted as if it were simply a family meal and offered bits of gore to the hollow reavers and to Victor. He was doing unspeakable, sickening things and having a glorious time doing them. For the rest of the night, the evil, childish creature found new and terrible ways to sicken Victor. It ripped the man's tongue off with one of its spectral fingers tossing it in the air a couple of times and trying to catch it with its mouth. The rendered pieces of meat missed a few times and landed on the ground. The creature, undaunted, threw it up again and again until it finally caught it with its ugly yellow teeth. It more or less dined on the man's other limbs like it did with the right leg. The demon would occasionally rip out an internal organ to flavor its meal, probably for the sake of show. It'd say something like, this needs a little kidney and then tear open the man to produce the organ. After hours of pure depravity, the end would finally come for poor Paul. The end seemed to take forever to come. Watching the poor man's dismemberment was pure torture. You could see the anguish in his face as every move the demon made struck him with searing pain. Harsh breaths came fast and sharp as he attempted to suffer unbearable grief. Well, everyone, he said after finishing off the man's second kidney, you don't know it, but I have to be going. The creature stretched greatly and let out a loud, screeching howl. Victor noticed Paul was still alive, quivering on the ground. His chest was slowly rising and falling. The creature did a drawn-out stretch this way and that, then walked around the clearing as if working off the meal. Then it walked to the soldier, stopping at his head. 
The man couldn't possibly know it was there. Both eyes were gone at this point. The ears were gone, long ago too, maybe for hours. The creature reached once again with those ugly, black, root-like fingers. They bored deeply into the man's throat, unimpeded by muscle, tendons, or cartilage. Got to be careful here, he said. I don't want to accidentally cut the jugular. Wouldn't want to kill it just yet. Oh, yeah, he found that really funny and laughed. As soon as the monster hit that spot that he wanted, he ripped his hands out of the man's throat fast. The beast held his hand to his eyes, looked at what he'd drawn out from the man, and he, he seemed quite happy with whatever he'd done. This is the man's windpipe, I believe, the demon child said, popping the bone into its mouth and chewing it like gum. Sad to say that losing that might be fatal. The creature began to mock him with crying noises and fake sad faces. After a final twitch or two from poor Paul, I could tell it was finally over for him. All signs of life were finally gone. Oh, Paul, I barely knew you, I oxic snickered. Then the demon child shot its many mist-like appendages through what at this point was essentially a lifeless torso and head, tearing the man's body into a great number of smaller pieces. If the soldier wasn't dead, this most certainly would have done the job. It was then that Victor decided the beast's strength was clearly superhuman and awesome, as well as deep disturbing. All right, everybody, clean up time, the vile thing said in that child voice. It was disturbing the way he said it, like the beast was announcing recess to a class of kindergartners, you know? It, it was exuberant about whatever this next part entailed. He waved his arms over his heads once again, and at first I didn't see anything, but like, like the demon was casting a spell or something, but, but nothing happened. The nightmare of what was about to happen finally dawned on Victor when he saw the blood on the ground start to vibrate. Unfortunately, he got a bit too curious and looked closer. It was something he would regret and see repeated in many, many nightmares. There were thousands of tiny blue pods left in the blood on the ground. It occurred to him that this was the same blood the demon child had spilled from his own eyes in the beginning. The other pods left there were hatching. The pods hatched there before his eyes. They weren't exactly maggots or worms. Each creature had the body of a worm as long as maybe six inches. They also bore a set of legs near their head. Looking through books later, Victor found these creatures had no known ancestor humankind has ever witnessed. It possessed the front legs and head of a louse. The mouth of the creature was designed quite differently, though. Instead of a device meant to suck blood, each tiny mouth bore teeth and was meant to eat and rip flesh. The mouth had a piranha's small, razor-sharp teeth. The creatures were white, like they'd evolved in a deep, dark cave that never saw light. They were a sickening new species, and they had no problem moving themselves to the chunks of the dead man. Don't worry, said the demon child, as it stabbed a kind of finger spear through one of those insects and popped it into his mouth. These buggers won't leave a single drop of this guy for anybody to find, not even a hair. And that demon child was right. Within half an hour, the fat lice had finished everything. Not even a bloodstain was left. The demon child was done, too. He devoured the last of the now pinkish lice into his mouth and rubbed his stomach. That hit the spot, said the creature. I was numb by this point. I'd seen so many crimes against nature. Those last few hours, the idea of lice filled with bits of flesh being eaten by an evil apparition, it didn't hit me the way it should. I was mentally washed out. I looked around, noticing that the hollow reavers were slowly falling to the ground. It struck me as, as weird because well, I'd become so desensitized that I, I really didn't care now ghostly glowing eyes were now black and empty. The fish, without this glow, slowly wafted to the ground. Their bodies hit the ground without sound and without any impact on the surrounding area. They, they simply just broke into pieces and were swept away like, like snowflakes in a breeze. 
demon child used one of those black fingers like a toothpick. Started of prying stuff out of his teeth. Just walked away, leaving me there. I was a complete mess. I didn't have a clue what to do after a couple minutes when the beast was completely gone. I started to think maybe maybe this, this, this didn't really happen. I know now, all these years later, it, it did happen. I, it really did. Victor's face grew paler than before. That's a horrible story, Victor. Do you want me to get a doctor? asked Peter. This caused Victor to laugh once again with sadness. Again, he went into a barking cough. No, I'm not <coughs> I'm not hallucinating. This all happened. I, I wish it was only a mind fart, Victor said, shaking his head. It's worse than I explained, though. Victor looked off toward the window. The morning sun was steaming in. His face looked very old all of a sudden, sunken and weathered. Victor's hair was thin, showing pale skin and spots through the modest hairline. Even his large eyebrows looked like they had seen too many miles. His eyes were the thing that frightened Peter. His brother's eyes were always a lighter shade of bluish-gray and bright with life. But at this moment, they were full of fear and looked aged. His eyes looked sick and ghostly as he spoke. I've seen the child again and again since then. His torment never stops haunting you. Watching that devil feed that night was the beginning. I, I didn't know it then. I, I know it now. I had unknowingly made a contract to watch the damn thing feed from that point to the day I die. Again, Victor chuckled. He nearly coughed again, but held it back this time. I guess today <laughs> it'll finally be <clears throat> it'll finally be over, and I say. Good. Peter wasn't sure how to respond to this. You watched it feed again? Peter asked. Yes. Late at night in my dreams, he comes and gets me. The Stygian child swallows me somehow, and I'm taken to watch him make his crooked deals with another poor soul. See, the Hallow Reavers are us. The Reavers that are forced to watch these abominations again and again are, are the poor devils that have made the deal. He makes us watch. <coughs> he makes us watch as he feeds until we eventually are eaten ourselves. Victor leaned forward some. You know what? They always take the son of a bitchin' deal child knows how to get them to agree. Victor laid back and tilted his head away from Peter. He knows exactly how to manipulate people to get his sick pleasure, whispered Victor. Why don't people just cremate themselves then? I mean, if there isn't the body to eat, he can't do whatever he does, Peter asked. Some have tried. I was there watching as the demon rose a man's ashes back from nothing. It's futile. The beast has outsmarted everyone. I guess this demon probably has been around for as long as it says. I mean, with what it's able to, able to do, that well, that wouldn't surprise me. He was wheezing a lot now from excitement. Peter moved a bit closer to him and tried his best to look passive. Calm down, Victor. You need to relax or you'll start coughing again. Don't let yourself get agitated. Peter said softly. You know, not once did I call the bastard by what he wanted to be called. He asked me to call him Sanguine, and even though he pushed me to call him it on a few occasions, that revolting night, I never did. Victor said it with a wide smile on his face, happy he'd at least done that. Victor looked like he wanted to admit something badly, but he couldn't bring himself to say it as he looked at his brother. Anyway, the beast come for me when I've passed. It probably won't come right when I die, though. It'll, it'll feed when the opportunity presents itself. It may be accompanied by a new poor soul who will start down the path that I accidentally walked. There'll be the Hallow Reavers, too. Poor souls of the damned, silenced 
and forced to watch as it feeds. Peter, you need to know one thing, and tell your girls, too. If, if some magical-looking ab abomination asks you to make a deal with him of any sorts, it is never worth it. Victor laid back, and all the electronics screeched with alarm. Peter knew it was bad. He stepped back when people rushed into the room. It wasn't long until Dr. Norman said quietly to Peter, Sorry, he's gone. Peter was subconsciously drawn to his watch. He needed to know that his brother's time of death was not preordained. He actually heard himself gasp when his watch read that the time was 9-11. He began moving toward the tiny cafe down the hall for a coffee. He was planning to stay for a while at this little coffee cubby to escape. He glanced at the face of his watch once in a while as his mind processed the information it was receiving. He lost his brother. The horror story his brother had told him was so terrifying it caused Peter to go into a fog. Peter started wondering if it were true. Visions of demons and flesh being torn from others filled his mind. He was snapped out of it when he heard Dr. Norman discussing something loudly back and forth with the nurse back toward his brother's room. Where's Mr. Rothwell from room 16? They couldn't have taken him yet. I, I don't think we called down there yet. His brother is still here and hasn't even had time to do any paperwork yet, Dr. Norman said in a raised voice. I don't know. We never move people like that. I'll talk to Tammy, said the nurse excitedly. She quickly headed to the other side of the floor. Peter hadn't taken the story his brother told him all that seriously. Peter thought maybe his brother had some sort of mental issues near the end. It isn't unheard of for people on certain drugs, coupled with pneumonia, to have hallucinations or tell odd stories. However, his brother's body disappearing surprised and shook him. He took the red envelope he received from Victor and carefully removed the key that had a business card attached. The card was for a bank not far from the medical campus. At the bank, Peter was shown to a room where he flashed his identification to a clerk. Upon opening the box, he saw a small pile of money, a card with instructions, and a carefully placed, neatly folded piece of stationery. On the stationery was the letter Victor had handwritten for him. The letter said, My dear brother Peter, I've included a list of incidentals I need done after I pass. I assume by now my body has gone missing. Don't worry about me. I'm at peace now. Of at least this, I am sure. I am finding as I write this, I am sadder than ever before in my life that I never really got to know you and your family. I know it's mostly my fault, but I hope you forgive me. I never really knew how to talk to you about these things. I think you knew this to be the case, and so you let me be. By now I will have told you the story of the night I was visited by the demon. I was told by the demon I would tell you what I did, and so I know that is what I will do. You need to know one further thing about our meeting. The demon came to me and made me promises. If I was to die and never meet my brother, I don't know if that would have been enough to sway me. I know that is what I'll be telling you when I die, but it isn't entirely the truth. I'd have died before I made a deal with a demon for my own life. The demon foretold that I'd never meet my new brother because my brother would die shortly after his birth. It was your death that the demon explained to me he could spare. I was at the time surprised I had a baby brother on the way, and soon. I couldn't bear the thought of not having a little brother. I needed to take the gamble to save you. I think the demon knew I'd long for a brother. I don't regret it, though. However, the demon never told me the whole story, that your mother would die in the crash you were to die in. I'd saved the life of my brother that had robbed us of your mother. I couldn't face your dad or you for the guilt after that, and so I think that caused a wedge between us. I don't know if your mother died in your stead or if you were both doomed in that accident, but I intervened on your behalf. The death of your mother, the listlessness in our father, and the terrible knowledge of my inevitable fate with the demon caused me to fear you, I think. 
You might think I was mad at you because of the way things worked out, but it wasn't you. I was angry with myself. Bad things happened, and I spent a lot of time just coping. I should have been a better brother. Sorry. Victor. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, including the show's Weirdos Facebook group, on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. The Stygian Child is written by Darren Sulls and is a work of fiction. You can find a link to the original story in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. James 3.18 And a final thought from the Dalai Lama. Share your knowledge. It's a way to achieve immortality. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.